2.0, qui suit à la première tournée de sensibilisation de 2018 autour des défis démographiques et du marché du travail auquel fait face le nouveau Brunswick. This event is bilingual and we have simultaneous interpretation provided. You can choose the language of your choice on the lower right hand corner of your screen. Alors cet événement est bilingue et nous avons l'interprétation simultanée. Vous pouvez choisir la langue de votre choix au bas de votre écran à la droite. Nous visitons 15 régions différentes de la province, apportant des données sur le remplacement de la main d'œuvre, des informations sur l'importance de l'immigration pour les finances publiques du Nouveau-Brunswick, les impacts de l'immigration future sur Brunswick's public finances, the impacts of future immigration on key systems, les gouvernements locaux et les communautés de s'organiser en soutien de l'immigration au niveau local. We are also making the space for people, employers, community members, newcomers uh, to share their stories and experiences of immigration. People are coming into our province and everyone has a role to play in the creation of communities and workplaces where notions of diversity, inclusion and equity are valued and at the heart of policies, processes and planning. L'immigration est un sujet en constante évolution au Nouveau-Brunswick et de nouvelles conversations sont encore nécessaires pour s'assurer que nos nouveaux résidents trouvent des possibilités et un soutien significatif pour eux de choisir d'appeler le Nouveau-Brunswick et vos communautés leur chez eux. Today, we dedicate this session to the Greater Moncton area. Before we dive in, I would like to acknowledge the unceded Wolstokway, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy territories we currently stand on and wish to thank them for allowing us to gather. Reconnaître la terre est une façon d'exprimer notre gratitude envers ceux dont nous sommes sur leur territoire, est une façon, uh, et une façon d'honorer le peuple autochtone qui vit et travaille sur ces terres depuis des temps immémoriaux. Il est important de comprendre la longue histoire qui nous a amenés à résider sur ces terres et d'honorer cette histoire alors que nous continuons à y accueillir de nouvelles familles et travaillons ensemble à avancer sur la voie de la réconciliation. Je tiens également à remercier nos bailleurs de fonds et nos organisations partenaires qui ont contribué à cet événement. Alors, le gouvernement du Nouveau-Brunswick et Travail NB, l'Agence de promotion économique du Canada Atlantique, le Conseil d'entreprise du Nouveau-Brunswick, l'Association francophone des municipalités du Nouveau-Brunswick, le Conseil économique du Nouveau-Brunswick, Tech Impact, Dialogue NB, le Réseau en immigration francophone du Nouveau-Brunswick, la Coopérative de développement régional, l'Université du Nouveau-Brunswick, l'Université de Moncton, New Brunswick Community College, le Collège communautaire du Nouveau-Brunswick et la Commission des droits de la personne. For this particular virtual event, I um, want to thank very, very much all the organizing partners, including the City of Moncton, the City of Dieppe, the Town of Riverview, the Chamber of Commerce for Greater Moncton, Expansion Dieppe, the Greater Moncton Local Immigration Partnership, the Multicultural Association of the Greater Moncton Area, and uh, the, the Centre d'Accueil et d'Accompagnement Francophone des Immigrants du Sud-Est du Brunswick, donc le CAFI. And finally, before introducing our special speakers this morning, I have the obligation to set some ground rules and mention some housekeeping items to ensure that this is a productive experience for everyone, including you, our, our participants. First, this event will have three parts. Uh, we'll start with a presentation from a resident economist, David Campbell and Richard Sayon, followed by a brief Q&A, a panel, as well as a period of discussion before we close. We want this event to mean something to you. So please do engage with questions in the chat function within Zoom. As a facilitator, I will be picking a few and asking them during the Q&A period or the discussion period. However, you will also have a chance to ask your questions in person. And to do so, please use the raise hand function and I will mention your name and tell you when you can ask your question and unmute. We ask that you keep your microphones on mute unless you're told to otherwise to avoid any background noise or sound feedback. We also encourage you to turn on your cameras. It's always better to see faces and it leads to a much deeper and more meaningful engagement. If we have any tech interruptions, please stay with us. It's always a risk as we try to do something like this live, um, but hopefully we'll be avoiding any interruptions this morning. Uh, this session will be recorded and uh, we are providing, as I mentioned before, simultaneous interpretation. So please choose the language of your choice. And for anyone who's unable to join us or if you do need to leave the session, you can uh, find the recording afterwards of the new conversations uh, 2.0 website. And with that, I would like to introduce uh, three municipal leaders from the area for some welcoming remarks, starting with the mayor of the city of Moncton, Mayor Don Arnold. 
uh, your worship, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Nicole. Good morning, everyone. C'est un énorme plaisir d'être parmi vous pour cette conversation si importante pour le futur de notre collectivité. Um, we've got a lot going on um, from an immigration perspective at the city of Moncton. We're really excited about our refreshed Greater Moncton Immigration Strategy and the awesome partnerships that we have with the other municipalities and so many people around the table today. I want to talk about a few of the main elements that we've achieved over the last year. Um, our newcomer and international student job fairs, we have filled over 390 positions contributing over $15 million in payroll. Our next job fair is this Friday, March 19th, and we have 16 employers registered and hundreds of positions available. Some other big things that we've achieved over the last year that the immigration greater Moncton website which is an awesome resource for so many people ongoing attraction events to ensure our pipeline is strong and our immigration grants are really playing paying dividends with really awesome projects like uh, le projet jumelage de, avec les étudiants de l'université de Moncton um, in the current strategy, the city of Moncton is uh, very aware of the work that needs to be done on employment, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And um, myself, along with our, our senior management team, uh, we've, we're about, I think tomorrow will be nine hours into some very intense uh, training around this. Um, and I, I believe that one of the upcoming panelists, uh, Manju Barma, uh, is, is one of the people that is working with us on this. And uh, we are really committed to ensuring that Moncton is not only focused on attracting uh, new talent to our region, but that everyone who comes here to call Moncton home, to feel integrated and included in our community. So in conclusion, immigration will be essential as we know for our economic uh, uh, recovery. And I'm sure the economists will be talking about that. We need this skilled labor to fill uh, all kinds of gaps, but we recognize so much the uh, amazing and immense contribution that new residents bring as they become our neighbors, friends, colleagues, and together how we build a more inclusive community. So, merci beaucoup pour cette uh, occasion aujourd'hui et j'ai hâte de participer dans la conversation. Merci. Merci beaucoup, uh, Mayor Arnold. Uh, next, we have uh, the Mayor of Riverview, uh, Mayor Siemens, who's here joining us. Your Worship, the screen is yours. Morning, everyone. I'm so pleased to be here this morning, and I thank the province of New Brunswick and Nicole for, give, uh, for inviting us to be part of this. The town of Riverview is pleased to be among the municipalities, organizations that are working for a solution to a significant challenge with too many, too few people and uh, for the jobs that are available. We wholeheartedly support efforts to attract more people to our province, including newcomers from other countries. We want people to come, we want people to stay. The Town of Riverview supports any and all efforts to create safe and inclusive environments for newcomers. We must ensure that all citizens have access to equal opportunities and face no discrimination regardless of their status. New Brunswick may be facing an economic challenge with its labor market, but the town of Riverview firmly believes that if we work together, we can make this a uh, and turn it into an opportunity, a chance for current residents to broaden their culture, perspectives as we welcome newcomers and help those new friends become a part of the increasingly diverse maritime family. I look forward to hearing about what we can help can do in the province of New Brunswick to improve uh, the efforts and make it a success. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Siemens. Et maintenant, j'aimerais vous présenter le maire de Dieppe, Mayor Lapierre. Monsieur le maire, uh, merci beaucoup d'être avec nous ce matin. L'écran est à vous. Merci bien. Uh, je vais... Uh... Pour, pour accélérer le processus, je vais tout simplement dire, euh, un peu comme mes, mes collègues euh, avec qui on travaille quand même de, de, de très près. Alors, pour nous, chez nous, à la ville de Dieppe, euh, l'immigration francophone en particulier est, est certainement une priorité majeure. D'ailleurs, nous avons ajouté euh, euh, du personnel dans la dernière, euh, ben, à peu près 18 mois passés maintenant de façon à, à ce qu'on puisse mieux euh, euh, apprécier 
et gérer la situation des, euh, des nouveaux arrivants euh, qui, qui viennent s'installer chez nous dans la, dans la région, mais particulièrement à Dieppe et encore une fois particulièrement le secteur francophone. Nous reconnaissons tous euh, l'importance de l'immigration euh, envers l'économie de notre région, de toute la province essentiellement. C'est certain, mais particulièrement évidemment un grand focus sur notre région et euh, on veut, on sait que déjà euh, plusieurs euh, nouveaux arrivants euh, font partie du tissu de nos communautés déjà et euh, nous voulons continuer à améliorer la situation des nouveaux arrivants euh, de façon euh, d d du côté économique en particulier, mais aussi du côté euh, culturel, euh, s'assurer que nous, euh, euh, nous incluons tout le monde dans nos, dans nos activités autant que possible. Et euh, on a bien hâte de continuer à travailler avec euh, la province du Nouveau-Brunswick dans ce secteur et avec euh, tous euh, mes collègues euh, que je salue encore une fois aujourd'hui. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Mère Lapierre. Merci à, à Mère Simmons et Mère euh, Arnold également. Um, alors, euh, maintenant, j'aimerais vous présenter nos deux économistes euh, afin, que, afin de passer à, à la session, de, à leur présentation. Uh, puis, même avant, je vais vraiment vous encourager à soumettre vos questions dans le chat ou lever la main en personne si vous avez des questions à propos de leur présentation ou des réflexions à, à partager. En premier, um, Monsieur Richard Saillant. Euh, économiste et consultant en politique publique. Euh, Richard est basé à Moncton et est un ancien cadre du secteur public avec 20 ans d'expérience dans les milieux gouvernementaux et universitaires. Il a passé près de 15 ans à Ottawa dans divers ministères, y compris le bureau du Conseil privé Industrie Canada et Transport Canada. Il a écrit ou réalisé quatre livres, dont « Au bord du gouffre, agir maintenant pour éviter la faillite du nouveau Brunswick » et « Deux pays, le Canada à l'ère du grand déséquilibre démographique ». We also have with us today uh, Mr. David Campbell. David is a former chief economist uh, from, for the New Brunswick Jobs Board and founded his own economic development consulting and research firm, Jupia Consultants Inc. in 2008. Based in Moncton as well, he is one of Atlantic Canada's leading economic development consultants. He has worked with more than 80 local, provincial, and national economic development agencies, industry associations, and government departments in six Canadian provinces and two American states. He holds a certificate in economic development from the University of Waterloo in Ontario and an MBA from Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. Good morning, David and Richard, and thank you very much for being with us uh, this morning. The screen is yours. D'accord. Uh, je vais commencer uh, la présentation. Je vais parler en français pour environ 6-7 minutes. Ensuite, je vais donner le flambeau à... À David, je vais commencer par d'abord vous remercier d'être là en si grand nombre aujourd'hui et partager mon écran. Ça va prendre quelques petits instants. Essentiellement, le but de la présentation aujourd'hui, ça va être de vous donner des, des données, un peu une mise à jour sur la situation d'immigration dans la région du Grand Moncton. Les nouvelles sont excellentes, comme vous allez le voir, comme vous le savez déjà, mais ça va nous permettre d'avoir un, un bon aperçu de l'évolution de la situation depuis notre dernière tournée, il y a trois ans. Et par la suite, David va vous offrir des scénarios euh, de croissance démographique euh, pour voir qu que, à quoi pourrait ressembler le futur si on pose un certain nombre d'hypothèses pour voir quelles sont nos, nos cibles un peu partout euh, à, travers la à, à travers la région de Moncton. Euh, comme vous, et, et ensuite parler un peu de, 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 de plan d'affaires, de, de comment... Euh, aborder l'avenir euh, compte tenu euh, de nos objectifs. Donc, moi, je vais commencer avec un peu un profil du défi démographique de la région de Moncton. Tel que je l'ai dit précédemment, euh, les nouvelles sont bonnes. Euh, vous allez le voir dans les chiffres et vous allez voir qu'il y a eu beaucoup de progrès euh, dans les dernières années. Euh, pour les fins de cette présentation, la région de Moncton, on la définit simplement comme étant la région métropolitaine de recensement de Moncton. Donc, ça inclut les cités de Moncton et de Dieppe, la ville de Riverview, les villages de Dorchester, Hillsboro, Membram Cook et Salisbury, ainsi que les paroisses de Dorchester, Elgin, Hillsboro, Opal, Moncton et Saint-Paul. Donc, lorsqu'on va vous parler de la région métropolitaine de Moncton, c'est de ce dont on parle aujourd'hui. Alors, commencer avec une diapo d'introduction. Comme vous le savez, le Nouveau-Brunswick, son défi est qu'il est plus âgé et vieillit plus rapidement que le Canada. Lorsqu'on regarde un graphique comme une diapo comme celle-ci, on le voit tout de suite, la génération du baby boom domine encore la pyramide des âges au Nouveau-Brunswick, alors qu'au Canada, c'est maintenant les milléniaux qui occupent la part la plus prépondérante de la pyramide des âges. 
La raison pour laquelle le Canada est moins âgé et vieillit moins rapidement, c'est parce qu'il a accueilli davantage de nouveaux arrivants au cours des décennies précédentes. Donc, le phénomène d'immigration au Nouveau-Brunswick, comme vous le savez tous, est plus récent. La bonne nouvelle, c'est que Moncton figure, fait, euh, cependant figure d'exception. Et là, on va regarder ce graphique-ci parce que c'est très intéressant. Chez les 0-14 ans, vous voyez que dans la région métropolitaine de Moncton, la croissance de la population au cours de la dernière décennie est plus forte que dans l'ensemble du Canada. Si vous regardez par contre les groupes d'âge, des jeunes adultes en âge de travailler, les 15-24 ans ou les 25-44 ans, la croissance au nouveau, à Moncton est bien sûr beaucoup plus robuste qu'elle ne l'est dans le reste du Nouveau-Brunswick. Par contre, ce que vous voyez, c'est qu'elle est plus faible qu'au Canada. Pourquoi? Parce que l'immigration est un phénomène plus récent au Nouveau-Brunswick. Donc, ça explique en partie pourquoi est-ce qu'on a encore, au niveau des plus jeunes travailleurs, on a encore un peu de rattrapage à faire, mais avec une forte croissance des jeunes comme celle que vous voyez là, ce n'est qu'une question de temps que Moncton va même rattraper sans doute euh, le reste du Canada en matière euh, de population de jeunes euh, adultes euh, en âge de travailler. Donc, bien sûr, Moncton fait un contraste important, mais quand vous regardez le Nouveau-Brunswick, vous voyez qu'il y a énormément de travail à faire quand même. Bien sûr, plus une population vieillit, plus l'économie tourne au ralenti. Je vais l'illustrer avec un graphique comme vous voyez là. À la gauche du graphique, vous voyez l'évolution du PIB réel au cours de la dernière décennie, juste avant la pandémie, donc 2019. Vous voyez qu'au Canada, l'économie a connu une forte croissance. L'économie est en hausse d'à peu près 25 par rapport à au tournant de la dernière décennie. Alors qu'au Nouveau-Brunswick, la croissance a été environ quatre fois plus faible. Qu'est-ce qui explique ça? Ben, C'est principalement le fait qu'au Nouveau-Brunswick, au cours de la dernière décennie, la population active, le nombre de travailleurs a diminué, alors qu'au Canada, la croissance a été robuste. À Moncton, on n'a pas une, des données fiables sur le PIB de Moncton. Il y a eu des tentatives de statistiques Canada de le mesurer, mais ce n'est pas encore, je dirais, « up to par », comme on dit en anglais. Donc, euh, on n'a pas les données sur le PIB dans la région de Moncton, mais on a les données sur la population active, puis elles, elles sont fortes. Ce qui laisse entendre, bien sûr, que l'économie a connu une très forte croissance euh, au cours de la dernière décennie, comme euh, le reste du pays euh, d'ailleurs. Ceci, c'est le graphique qui illustre le défi démographique de la région de Moncton. Euh, c'est un graphique qui est, pour Moncton, que je vous dirais, qui n'est vraiment pas euh, terrifiant. Okay? Alors que dans d'autres régions, je ne vais pas utiliser le mot terrifiant, mais dans d'autres régions, le graphique est beaucoup plus alarmant. Essentiellement, ce que vous voyez ici, c'est combien de, de, de gens atteignent l'âge de travailler à chaque année. Ça, c'est en gris, l'âge de 15 ans. Et combien de gens atteignent l'âge officiel de la retraite, qui est en rouge, l'âge de 65 ans. Depuis le tournant de la dernière décennie, le nombre de personnes qui atteignent l'âge... Line and the youth is the great. So, so now, uh, in 2011, the country's first boomers turned 65. So this is why you see the, the red line going above the gray line. So this is... So with that newcomers, the labor force of the Moncton CMA would decline modestly over the next 10 years, but... Now it is because of those immigrants, we are able to uh, palliate this lack. So this graph is, tells you to, the, the demographic challenge that is completely um, filled with the arrival of newcomers. In other regions, we don't see that. So there's an important impact of the past immigration. So to show that your challenge is much smaller here. Another important thing that is important is that uh, newcomers are often young adults who are typically of child-rearing age or they have children already. So one of the advantage of having newcomers, instead of seeing our schools uh, being emptied, so now... Uh, ce nouveau, ce beau monde. Donc, vous le voyez, une région comme Moncton, avec l'axe de gauche, vous voyez, a connu une croissance de son nombre de, per de personnes d'âge scolaire au cours de la dernière décennie d'environ 15 c'est très bien. Et puis, vous voyez que la croissance est beaucoup plus forte. Euh, ici, l'échelle devrait, euh, devrait être de, de 2000 à 2020. Là. Euh, mais donc, pour ça, les chiffres sont les bons, c'est l'échelle qui n'est pas la bonne. Alors que vous voyez que pour le reste du Nouveau-Brunswick, ça s'est stabilisé. Il n'y a pas de croissance du nombre de jeunes. Donc, le défi est encore de faire croître le nombre de jeunes dans le reste du Nouveau-Brunswick. Donc, le, le, vous voyez le, la puissance de l'immigration pour augmenter le nombre de jeunes et la population d'âge scolaire. Donc, c'est très fort. 
Cela dit, euh, puis je vais conclure avec ça avant de passer le flambeau à, à David, cela dit, il, de, il demeure qu'il y a des défis encore importants au Nouveau-Brunswick. Moncton fait figure un peu d'exception, mais lorsqu'on regarde le Nouveau-Brunswick... So, Moncton is an exception, but when looking at New Brunswick, on this graph, you're seeing essentially that, that the... We have a, a great need for local services. So this is oftentimes public uh, services. Sometimes uh, private uh, services are also local services. But we're seeing that the uh, private sector is going down and higher the public sector. So the important, uh, our, our, our challenge here is to make sure as that the private sector grows so that there may be uh, taxes, of course, and uh, income, uh, you know, And so also that people, so we want to grow both curves and we want to make sure that everyone's taken care of at whatever age, especially old age. So here, another graph. Thus far, we saw that oftentimes we saw that we're seeing that despite progress, serious labor market challenges remain. So, so at six, okay, so. So 75 years, so it's 10, 12,000 and, and 75,000. So, so every 15 years, every 10 years, uh, there's doubling of the healthcare uh, fees. So in New Brunswick... The baby boomers, the baby boomers, the plus aged, attain 75 years this year. Okay, so in the future, the number of people aged from 65 to 75 will remain stable. The number of people aged from 75 and plus will pass from 65,000 to 140,000 in 15 years. Donc, vous voyez l'impact que ça va avoir à gauche. Vous voyez le graphique qui illustre les pressions induites uniquement par le vieillissement. Ça ne tient pas en compte les hausses de salaire dans le secteur de santé. Ça ne tient pas en compte l'effet de la technologie. C'est juste le fait que notre structure d'âge se modifie. D'ici quatre ans, on peut parler d'environ 350, milliards, 350 millions de dollars constants de 2017 dans quatre ans. En 2030, environ 700 millions de dollars par année. Et en 2035, environ 1,1 milliard de dollars. Donc, ça, c'est seulement les pressions induites par le vieillissement. Clairement, euh, pour pouvoir faire face à ce défi-là, espérons qu'on aura des ressources d'Ottawa, mais espérons aussi qu'on réussira à faire croître notre économie davantage pour, encore une fois, soutenir le phénomène euh, de vieillissement au sein de notre province. Donc, avec ça, je vais m'arrêter ici et je vais maintenant passer euh, la parole et aussi l'écran à David. Merci, Richard. So, thank you very much for that. So I'm just going to share my screen. And I hope everybody can see this. And unless I see anybody waving at me, uh, I will continue with my portion of the presentation. So I'm going to take maybe 15 minutes to walk you through some population growth scenarios for the greater Moncton region. Uh, we've been doing this Uh, as was said earlier, around the province in 15 different locations. And, uh, Autour de la province, dans différentes locations. Numbers look good. Le région, pardon. Region. So these are the numbers of permanent residents admitted to New Brunswick through 2019. Uh, in 2019 was a record year. We had 6,000 permanent residents admitted to New Brunswick. That was up significantly from the last two years and on a very positive trajectory, of course, before COVID-19. Uh, which brought those numbers down almost 50% in 2020. Uh, but we're hopeful uh, that now that we're coming, we can see light at the end of the tunnel here in terms of the pandemic, we can get back to the growth rate uh, we were seeing before. Here in the greater Moncton region, in the last three years, uh, we've attracted an average of 1,400 immigrants per year. And that, as Richard has said, has really bolstered population growth uh, and started to rebalance the demographic situation here in the greater Moncton region. So uh, Richard talked a little bit about K-12 education. I'll just sh show you uh, a little chart that I did, a little uh, report that I did for the Multicultural Council. You can download the full analysis on their website, but basically just trying to understand how the newcomer population could uh, rebuild the K-12 student population in the province. And so basically what I looked at was the born in New Brunswick population and the trend Uh, in the uh, school-aged uh, population, uh, looking forward 10 or 15 years. And you can see here the bottom part of this, these bars shows that there's a slow but steady decline in the population uh, born in New Brunswick that's in the K-12 system uh, over the next decade or so. 
And you can see that if we hit our immigration targets and continue to grow uh, our newcomer population, as Richard said earlier, uh, a lot of those folks are young families. They have young children already. And many of them uh, are, have school age children already. Uh, and they're, uh, at, when they land here, when they settle here, they're actually uh, uh, putting their kids in our school system. So you can see here that within 10 years, based on the forecasts that we did and the population projection we did here, uh, the uh, newcomer population were more than offset around the province. Uh, the K-12 enrollment, and in fact, enrollment should start to increase province-wide. They already are increasing in Fredericton and in the Moncton region. Uh, but if we look at the numbers province-wide, they should start to uh, grow uh, uh, over the next few years as we attract more newcomers to the province. So what we did was we looked at three population growth uh, scenarios for 15 regions around the province. So uh, the first slide here is why do we need to grow our population? And of course, in this region, we've had these discussions were pretty clear about the need, as the, the mayors mentioned earlier, but we have many strategically important industries. Mentionné, mais on a bien sûr des nombreuses industries stratégiquement importantes. On avait une, des nouvelles opportunités de croissance. On a une grosse économie du côté de services. Donc, donc. Tourism and IT in service industries and manufacturing. So fundamental to all of that growth or growth potential is the ability to, to meet the workforce needs and also the entrepreneurial needs, right? Part of what we're talking here is about attracting uh, entrepreneurs as well to our region. So the three growth scenarios were, what is the current population trajectory? So if we change nothing, if we continue to see the growth rate that, uh, that we've seen over the past five years, where does that take us by 2040? The second scenario is the population growth needed to maintain the current size of the workforce. So if we don't want to shrink the workforce, what kind of population growth do we need? And scenario three is actually what kind of population growth do we need if we actually want to expand the workforce at an average annual rate of 0.5%. And as you can imagine, as we went around the province, the, the, these numbers are significantly different depending on the region that you're in. Uh, why do we want these three scenarios? As I said, to show the current population trajectory for our region, uh, to show what would happen if we just wanted to increase the workforce, uh, to maintain the current size of the workforce, and if we wanted to actually grow the workforce. So the first scenario, it, it, again, for most of the regions across the province, the current trajectory is not going to sustain workforce needs. In other words, more people are going to retire and leave the workforce than we have coming into the workforce in terms of younger people. Uh, this is not the case in the greater Moncton area because of the work that's been done over the last, I would say, closer to 10 years, but certainly the last five. Uh, we've seen an influx of younger population, as Richard outlined earlier, uh, and what that means is that on the current trajectory, we are forecasting using this model that the population will increase by 27% between now and 2040, uh, or uh, a population at that time of 201,000. So basically, in the methodology I used to calculate this was the Statistics Canada uh, has population growth scenarios for the province as a whole. They do not do it for metropolitan areas, but I took the provincial forecast, high growth scenario, and then I modified it based on the specific dynamics and trends that we see here in Greater Moncton. So again, it's not a perfect model, but it does provide us a picture of what the future could look like. And what this means is we would actually see a workforce increase of 21% from 87,700 estimated uh, in 2020, to 106,200. So that swelling of the workforce will mean we have much more uh, uh, workers and entrepreneurs uh, to support growth and export focused industries and ensure we have enough workers to support local industries like healthcare and so on. So that really, if we continue on the current path uh, here in the greater Moncton region, uh, 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 the numbers look good. Now I'm not saying it's gonna be easy to keep this growth rate. Uh, it's about a one and a half percent growth rate per year in the population. Uh, but we have, or 1.3%, but we have seen it and we have followed that trend for a number of years. So I think the numbers look solid. Now, again, in the case of the greater Moncton region, if we only want to maintain the current size of the workforce, we, we would actually have to see a slowing population growth rate. 
back down to just under 10% over the next 20 years. The workforce would stay at around 87,700. Uh, but as I said, the, work, the actual population growth rate would decline from 1.3% per year to 0.5% per year. So this is basically saying we, you know, we could see a significant decline and still have the same workforce in terms of size within 20 years. Now, the problem with that, as Richard has pointed out on many occasions, is we're going to see increasing demand for healthcare services and other services, and that could crowd out the workforce for other export-focused sectors. So again, even if we maintain the current size of the workforce, uh, it's really uh, somewhat problematic if we want to continue to grow the economy and continue to drive economic growth for the province overall uh, here in the greater Moncton region. If we want to grow the workforce out of Moz, 0.5%, we would have to see population growth of about 18, a uh, little over 18%. Uh, and that would increase the workforce by just under 9,000 or 8,700 uh, uh, between now and 2020. So again, this is below uh, what we're seeing in the current trajectory. So if we were already growing our workforce at above the rate here in, the, in, this, in this specific scenario, but the good news is again, as I said earlier, with a growing workforce, it provides opportunities for uh, growing new sectors of the economy and taking advantage of the economic opportunities we have here in the greater Moncton region. So I guess the conclusion from these three scenarios, and you will be able to download the full report uh, on the website. I'm not sure it's up there now, but it, it will be soon. And you can download the full uh, population projection, including the methodology uh, from the Multicultural Council website from the new conversations uh, website, uh, microsite that was set up. But I think the conclusions are to keep doing what you're doing. The plans were set and I had a little bit to, of an involvement uh, with the development of the immigration strategy. And I think we need to keep focusing on that plan and the targets in that plan, uh, current course and speed. Uh, but it is important for folks in the Greater Moncton realize, to, region to realize that historically, uh, this area relied on intra-provincial migration and natural population growth. So essentially, we attracted a lot of people from elsewhere in New Brunswick, from northern New Brunswick and elsewhere in the province. Uh, and we had a lot more births than we had deaths, which provided a very positive natural population growth rate. Uh, now, moving forward through 2040, we will have to rely increasingly uh, on attracting people from outside New Brunswick. There's going to be less net intra-provincial migration. That's the trend we've seen over the last few years, and that will continue uh, as other regions look to bolster their population and, and actually grow their population as well. So our growth here in the Greater Moncton region is going to come primarily from attracting folks from outside the province. And the other thing that's increasingly important, and uh, I know Richard's been writing on this and others, is we need to ensure there's good housing options for people moving into the regions. People are retiring, uh, but they're not leaving. Uh, so that means if we're going to fill their place in the workforce, we have to have new housing uh, to support population growth. And that housing needs to be uh, reasonably affordable. It needs to be aligned with the household income levels uh, of the folks that are joining the workforce. And a lot of them are younger. Uh, and so we need to make sure we have a good mix of rental uh, uh, options, uh, options for young families and reasonably pr priced housing options. This will be a barrier not only here in Greater Moncton, but across the province, if we can't ensure that we have reasonable and affordable housing options for people moving into the province moving forward. So just a couple of things on the, on the Moncton uh, region growth plan. It's important to realize that, that uh, again, we've been doing this tour around 15 different uh, jurisdictions around the province and some are more ahead than others. And of course, uh, the Moncton region is, Greater Moncton is further ahead than most in terms of understanding what needs to get done to make this happen. But I would say here, we've been, our message across the provinces is, is this is just, this is not just about the provincial government. Uh, it's really about local government, local uh, leaders, local institutions getting involved and making sure uh, that we're a welcoming and opening community and that we're uh, providing a very good environment for newcomers uh, that are moving to our region. And I just have a little chart that I have in the, in the report basically showing that, you know, the expectations now on municipal government are much more than they were, say, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, back when uh, we, we, you know, municipalities did sort of the core stuff, uh, water and sewer and, and uh, garbage removal and public safety. Now we want them to be 
attracting population, promoting the community, working much more on, on quality of life issues and trying to ensure that their community is a beautiful place uh, to live because now we're competing uh, with countries across Canada and across North America for population. So we're asking a lot more of our local uh, government and, uh, and uh, in the case, I think here in Greater Moncton, we've seen all three municipalities stepping up and taking on these uh, challenges quite well. So again, uh, as Richard mentioned in his early in his remarks, we see this as, as uh, more than just a population growth plan. It's, it's, it's more of a comprehensive business plan. And what that means is just that you need to understand if you're going to grow the population, there's lots of other things that have to be in place to support that, including economic development uh, focus, what industries have potential to grow, uh, what level of population we need, and also what are the barriers uh, that could hold back that population growth, such as housing, uh, local support infrastructure, language training, settlement services, and so on. So, you know, we, 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 we sort of drive population growth targets, we put them out there, we work toward them, but then we got to make sure we have all of this other uh, infrastructure in place to support uh, retention and growth moving forward. So that's my presentation. So I'm going to turn it back over uh, to Nicole for, uh, for some questions and answers. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Richard and David. So we're going to dive into the Q&A period. And again, I encourage everyone to you know, send in your questions through chat, or if you want to chime in in person, please don't hesitate to do the, the raise hand uh, symbol and we'll give you uh, the screen. Um, first question that's come in, um, what are the biggest obstacles to achieve the best case scenario that you presented, David? Is it lack of housing, government immigration quotas, regulations, et cetera? And it's a question for both uh, David and Richard. So I'll start. I think it's, it, in, historically, it is a challenge to sustain 1.3% population growth over a very long period of time. Now, this community has done it. I look back into the 90s. Uh, and this, this growth rate has been sustained or exceeded going all the way back uh, 30 years or more. So this community has a track record of doing that. But if there's any big recession or other, you know, other uh, blip like pandemics that actually put, a, put a, a, a crimp in that. But I'm very confident this region can continue to grow. It just needs to make sure that, that, that these, these impediments that can get in the way of growth like housing uh, uh, are addressed um, in the short term. Thank you, David. Richard? Well, briefly, just to add to what David has said is that, to me, uh, the biggest uh, challenge, it won't be a surprise, is uh, housing that is kept affordable. Uh, a lot of newcomers uh, take jobs that, you know, are not that well-paying. The, the, the salaries are not always extremely high. So fun fundamentally, there's a value proposition. And part of the value proposition that New Brunswick offers is that uh, while uh, average weekly earnings tend to be lower, earnings tend to be a little lower than the Canadian average, housing makes up for that. Now, if the gap starts narrowing to a point where the value proposition is no longer that attractive, we may see that the region will not be as attractive as it was before. And uh, on housing, the way I see it is as follows. About three or four years ago, the vacancy rate in New Brunswick was at around 6%. That meant that there was room to grow and people, when they, they, there was not a lot of pressure on rents. So when people came to a community, it didn't inflate rents, it didn't create a pressure on rents. Now we're at about 2%. In a place like Fredericton, in some, certain categories of apartments, it's below 1.5% or even 1.5%, which is a rate that is consistent with Vancouver or Toronto. So you, when you start uh, depleting the reserves of housing, that's where you start seeing the pressures on prices. And last year, the Moncton area is, seems to be the place that has done the best in terms of attracting immigrants during the pandemic. And it's not a surprise that in that context, same unit rents, okay? So the, the same, not all apartments, but just the same apartment, the CMHC tries to measure it how much uh, the, the rent grew. And I think it was about 5.5% last year. At 5.5%, that's about three times the growth in earnings or at least two times the growth in earning. And you start eating up the actual real wages quite fast. 
And so, so that's the, there's a price challenge and then there's gonna be a supply challenge. And I'm concerned that uh, for the apartments that are more aff affordable, the private sector left to itself may not be able to provide the supply that we need. I'm not saying that, so I'm saying that there must, there might be a need for providing incentives to try to, 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 to find ways to incent the private sectors to uh, grow the housing stock, the rental stock a bit more. This is not a challenge that's unique to Moncton. All across the, pro the province, we're seeing this challenge and it's the number one issue across the province. Why? Because as I said, the rental vacation ra vacancy rates went from 6% to 2%. So let's use, and I'm, stop, I'm gonna stop there. Let's Je vais m'arrêter ici. On va utiliser, uh, faire une analogie de l'économie. Lorsqu'il y a... Lorsqu'il y a un problème de main d'œuvre, on peut stimuler l'économie, on peut... There won't be any inflation. But when the, you're at full employment of resources and you have an inelastic good such as housing or oil or whatever, what happens is the market adjusts through price. And if we're about to double our immigration rates across the province, right, we move from five from 5,000 to 10,000, and we're already seeing the pressures we're seeing right now in a pandemic year, imagine what this is going to do to prices. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. And uh, David, other than housing, what infrastructure should be developed in the greater Moncton area or strengthening? I'll let you start. So I think certainly settlement services, the retention inclusion, the efforts we, we take collectively uh, to ensure that newcomers uh, and families are, 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 are um, integrating well into our community. And again, I would say this community is ahead of the curve in, in terms of the province overall, but there's still lots of work to be done. We wanna make sure that our newcomers are integrating well into social networks, into church networks, into anything that can help them put down roots here in the community. Uh, we'd like to see more small and medium-sized businesses hiring newcomers. Uh, a lot of times it's, it's more restricted to larger firms. So as we become a more multicultural society, uh, you know, we need to start seeing that sort of reflected more, uh, you know, even even things like um, uh, employment, you know, municipal government employment, or even even city and town council representation, we'd like to see that start to become more reflective of the population at large, which is becoming more multicultural and more diverse. So I think I wouldn't could, couldn't point to one thing, but I do think, you know, all of it, schools, hospitals, everything we look at, uh, needs to now start to reflect this more multicultural, more exciting uh, and dynamic population that we're seeing here in Greater Moncton. Great, thank you, David. Leisha? Just briefly, I fully agree with David and, and the Greater Moncton area is extremely resourceful and dynamic and is doing to me, what streams to me an outstanding job. Uh, but fundamentally, I think that we need to start seeing the idea of welcoming newcomers across this province with the same ambition and the same vision that we in 10, 20 years ago, we wanted to build or 30 years ago, wanted to build a four lane highway. And we thought that that was the infrastructure to grow the economy. Well now the, to grow the economy, the lifeblood of our growth is gonna be people. So whatever are the needs of people from daycares to uh, uh, education system, uh, we need to show the same vigor in terms of uh, uh, making sure that we make the proper investments to relieve uh, the bottlenecks to uh, expanding our capacity. I think that the Moncton region and the province will probably be able to draw more immigrants in the years ahead. We're competing with other regions, but as long as New Brunswick signals its intention to want to uh, ramp up immigration, I think Ottawa will accommodate that. That's not the issue. The issue is our welcoming capacity. So we should be looking at our bottlenecks. And I think right now, as I said, you know, you, you've asked beyond housing, but this is a key bottleneck and we need to be looking at bottlenecks and how do we address them? That's the way I see it. Thinking that the new lifeblood of the economy is welcoming new uh, newcomers, not creating jobs, but finding people to occupy the jobs that are that are available. Great, thank you. Um... Une question est, est venue pour Richard, puis c'est à propos de tes commentaires à propos du logement. Est-ce qu'il y a des moyens de réguler les, les coûts de l'allocation des résidences? Ben, c'est sûr qu'il y a des augmentations dramatiques, comme des, 30, des 35 euh, ce qu'on a vu dans certaines euh, anecdotes de la dernière année. À, à mon sens, c'est complètement inacceptable, c'est cavalier comme comportement. 
Mais euh, pour avoir des vraies mesures de plafonnement des loyers, un des défis avec ça, c'est lorsqu'on fait ça, premièrement, c'est injuste à l'endroit de ceux qui se cherchent un loyer, parce que c'est une façon de protéger ceux qui ont déjà un logement, mais ça n'incite pas à la construction supplémentaire. Donc, moi, je favorise des mesures de compensation des gens à faible revenu. Donc, euh, pour que tout le monde puisse, euh, parce que rappelons-nous, les victimes de la hausse des loyers ne sont pas que les nouveaux arrivants, c'est aussi les gens qui sont à faible revenu. Donc, ça devient un enjeu de, où la politique économique et la politique sociale se marient. Et puis, lorsqu'on a voulu faire la lutte à la pauvreté, euh, par exemple, au niveau fédéral avec la prestation canadienne pour enfants, on a réussi à réduire la pauvreté considérablement. Comment est-ce qu'on l'a fait? En accordant des gens aux familles, par exemple, à faible revenu. Donc, c'est un peu la même philosophie, c'est de comprendre qu'avec la croissance vient des défis supplémentaires. On commence à avoir des défis de grande ville. Donc, avec la croissance vient des défis et des responsabilités supplémentaires. Puis, je ne vise pas uniquement Fredericton quand je dis ça, c'est l'ensemble des pouvoirs publics et particulièrement les pouvoirs publics supérieurs, donc Ottawa et Fredericton, travailler ensemble pour avoir une stratégie d'ensemble. Merci, Richard. Now, if you don't mind, I'll just jump in because I do think that, you know, It, unfortunately, I talked earlier about all the new pressure put on municipalities, but if you look at Europe and even other places in North America, municipalities actually own a lot of housing. In some uh, cities and towns in, in Europe, they can own 40% of the housing, not just low income housing, housing in general. I'm not suggesting the city and the cities and towns should start owning housing, but I think if we get together with the developers, we set our objectives and we clearly understand what the roadblocks are, then I think we might be able to get to a solution. For example, maybe some sort of temporary reprieve on that double taxation, so-called double taxation on rental, in, rental housing, maybe for a short period of time to stimulate uh, development or other things that can be done to ensure the developer can make a, re, a, re, a, de a decent return on invested capital, but also that there's risk in the market as well, right? We don't want to take away developer risk. So I think there's solutions there And it is, there is a municipal responsibility there, but as Richard said, there's also provincial and federal. But I think we can, if we get our heads together, we can solve this. Great, thank you. Um, another question is, obviously the lack of doctors and nurses is a reality today in New Brunswick. And those are regulated professions. And it's hard even if you bring in nurses and doctors for them to practice here. How do you envision that we keep this population growth um, and still have reasonable health care systems? I'll, I'll try briefly. Um, we are going to have, uh, on, on the doctor's side, this is a perennial problem. And the issue of the supply of doctors is a very complex one, but we did a lot of progress by training our own doctors recently and that, that well, not that recently anymore. But on the nursing side, and this is something I believe we should have been doing quite some time ago, but think about the Francophone communities. Um, in the North, in the space of 20 years, uh, we lost 45% of our youth. So obviously the, the pipeline of individuals who can become nurses, and that's a tough profession, Uh, is not that great. And, and, and it explains also why David was saying that Moncton needs to rely on people outside the province because the North is, there's not that many people left to migrate. But anyways, I digress. Uh, on nursing, is initiatives such as one the University of Moncton has been proposing is that we bring more people from overseas, train them here, and then once they're trained here, they will be offered a very well, decently paying job, and they are likely to stay in New Brunswick afterwards. So we need to grow our pipeline because the competition for health professionals, particularly nurses, is ferocious globally. We're not the only ones to be aging. So we need to create our made in New Brunswick solutions when it comes to that. And it's really not going to be easy and it's going to be quite a challenge but it's going to be the same challenge across most of the country. Great. Thank you, Richard. David, do you have anything to add? Just, uh, I think it's a huge issue. It, there's no doubt about it. Uh, I would say, though, if you look at the Canadian uh, Community Health Survey, uh, over 90% of New Brunswickers claim to have a regular health care provider, and that's above the national level of 85%. So we still, well, this is 2018 data, so it's a couple of years dated, but I think comparatively speaking, we're, we're fairly well off, but that doesn't, you know, for newcomers coming, right, that struggle to find a doctor, a family doctor, that's a real issue, and we have to work to solve that. I've, you know, we, it, it literally follows population. 
you need X amount of doctors for X amount of population. And as we grow the population, we're not growing the number of doctors and, and other healthcare providers at the same level. And so we need to be working on that. And that, again, is, it is a barrier to future growth. The good news is, though, the after-hour clinic network in the, in the Moncton region has gotten much stronger in the last 15 or 20 years since, since I arrived here. And so most people should be able to get basic health care there, but that's not the solution. The solution is to ultimately ensure that all newcomer families have access to a family doctor. Great, thank you. Um, last question before we go in, on to the panel, and it kind of touches on uh, what um, you were talking about earlier. Um, do you have any reflections on how, on obviously the role of post-secondary institutions, you know, the role they play in growth, and um, also is their role changing over time David, to, you know, David, David I, I know you wrote a very good column on that last week, so I'll let you start. Yeah, I, I'm of the view that we have to actually dramatically expand the role of post-secondary education, particularly the colleges, but also the university because a lot of our small and medium-sized businesses and smaller employers really struggle to recruit internationally. So if we want them to hire newcomers, they should be on the ground. And what better way to do that is bring them through the college and university system. So I think that's a really great opportunity. If, you, if a newcomer comes, takes a, a one or two year course uh, or four year course, it doesn't matter. They have a postgraduate work permit that allows them to work basically anywhere. Uh, and that opens up new, the newcomer workforce to any small and large business across the region and across the province. So I think there's a bigger role. We have to make sure that's aligned with workforce needs. And as I pointed out in my column that, that Richard mentioned, I'd even like that to apply to short courses. So we have a shortage now of workers in construction, a growing shortage in, in the construction sector. They don't need a four-year university degree. Uh, so, but if we could bring them in and, and give them a short course in, in uh, you know, fundamental construction issues here in, in New Brunswick, and then graduate them with some sort of certificate and then allow them to go right into the workforce, I think that would be very beneficial. So I, I don't know about Richard, but I think there's a, an even increased role for our universities and colleges moving forward. Great. Uh I fully concur with David. Uh, I'll only add that uh, we, I showed you earlier the fact that the population of zero to 14 has grown very fast in Moncton. It's growing very fast in Fredericton. So just to show that years of strong inflows is going to strengthen the position of post-secondary education institutions. So there's a, you know, a virtuous cycle there, circle there. And so, so it's, it's positive news. It's much better than being I'm talking here today about uh, how do we fund uh, post-secondary institutions whose enrollments are declining. Great, thank you to you both. We'll be seeing you during the discussion period. Uh, we'll be moving on to our panel this morning, starting with our first panelist, Richard Cormier. Richard joined the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency in 2005 as a senior policy analyst seeking to help the agency and the region's stakeholders better understand the Atlantic economy and respond to its needs. His current focus uh, as the Director of Communities and Inclusive Growth is supporting Atlantic communities in becoming more inclusive, innovative, and diversified um, and uh, to helping the region grow. Uh, Richard is also a COA's Gender-Based Analysis Plus champion. Uh, he believes in the importance of regional economic development and that it can only be done by collaborating. Thank you very much for being with us uh, this morning, Richard. Uh, I will give you your, your five minutes to share your reflections. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to be here. Um, five minutes. Wow. After a great discussion like that, I, I, all I want to do is just react and add to what's already been uh, said. And I think a lot of it ties very well to what I wanted to share with you today. So I think I'll just, I'll be wearing both my hat as GBA plus champion for ACOA and as well as uh, uh, the program side of my day-to-day uh, -day job as communities and inclusive growth uh, director uh, for that uh, corporate uh, function. But I guess I, I wanted to share uh, mainly the, the story, uh, uh, the, the, the cultural shift that, uh, that is required when, when digging into diversity and inclusion and looking at that and how it influences policy development and program development and what you deliver. 
Um, so I, I guess, again, tying to what we've already heard, businesses for some time at ACOA, and this is certainly not new to us, they've been telling us that they need people, they need the skills, they can't find it, how, and, and it's, it's, it's hard to find it, and especially when you get into hiring newcomers, and as we just heard, uh, hiring internationally is, 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 a, is a whole function and a whole challenge in itself. And, um, so we've been hearing that for, for, for years and years, and this is something that ACOA is focused on. And I guess if I take my GBA plus uh, hat and put that on for a moment, uh, the role of GBA plus is to really put that that diversity lens onto what you're trying to do and and then communicate and advance in your in your approach. Um, for for some time, it's been yes, we know about the, the 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 value and the importance of population growth and and how newcomers fit into that. I guess what's shifted in my role at ACOA and GBA plus is to build onto that need, that recognized need, and, and add to the big why of why we need newcomers. And I think it, it really, uh, it's important to sort of relay on top of that, and we've heard from some of the interjections already, is that uh, there's a value uh, to bringing in newcomers uh, uh, beyond just um, the skills need. It's also an innovation opportunity. It is a diverse perspective opportunity that we can bring into the economy that I think we need to reinforce and build further into uh, these types of conversations, right? So as GBA Plus within ACOA, I've been uh, trying to communicate that story where, you know, we, we, we hear a lot from uh, McKinsey and company, uh, Deloitte, uh, where they're, you know, they've relayed and, and they're reinforcing that message quite well in terms of the, the innovation that comes with hiring, uh, having diverse hiring practices. Uh, you're, you're twice as likely to meet or exceed financial targets if, you're, if, you're, if you have more diversity in your company, particularly when it comes to executive levels and the C-suite uh, uh, of your organization. Uh, if you're that much more diverse, you have that much uh, of a better perspective. Uh, we talked about the increase in exports that we need to, to get at in the economy. This plays directly into that. So that's the storyline that we've been trying to, to build at ACOA, and, um, and particularly my role as GBA Plus. Um, so, and, and that, that brings in, you know, if you look at ACOA and the reason we exist, uh, ACOA, it, its very essence is, is to look at diversity. There is diversity in our country. The OECD in 2003 released a report that said, Canada is not one economy, but several. And so hence, uh, ACOA and the other RDAs across the country. So you would think that uh, looking at that, adding that inclusive lens and looking at diversity in terms of policymaking is it, it's definitely not new to us. And 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 we look at that in terms of uh, you know the the, the geography, uh, age, uh, gender, and so on. Uh, but this uh, you know advancement and thinking about hire, uh, hiring uh, newcomers and, and speaking to businesses about that um, that also requires an internal culture shift as well and advancement in our own organization to, to be able to get at that so that that's really uh, you know inclusivity is part of our DNA in a way but that needs to progress um, so so that's that's been a real challenge uh, in terms of trying to advance that within ACOA um, you know, we're in a pandemic, and despite that pandemic, um, uh, our president, uh, Francis McGuire, back in the fall, reinforced this importance uh, with, uh, with adding inclusivity as a broad priority lens for everything we do at ACOA. So we, he'll, he'll, he's out there, as you well know, talking about advanced manufacturing uh, and innovation and all its, its components, but he, he's very importantly focusing on inclusivity and, and immigration as well, as, as many of you well know. And so uh, he's been a, a, a great force of change at ACOA in terms of having us focus more uh, directly on immigration, so while perhaps in the past we would have spoken about recruitment being a big priority for, for ACOA and helping our institutions uh, in that regard, it's really turned us towards promotion of immigration as a, as a real uh, tool for growth, but also, uh, and we just touched upon it with the speakers that just uh, uh, shared um, uh, the, the idea of retention. And so that's that's a big shift for us as well. And that's something that we're really focused on more and more. 
uh, working with our partners at IRCC, uh, better understanding the settlement reality, the challenges of our employers. And I guess I'll end on that last point in terms of retention, and it, and it speaks a bit to sort of the greater challenges in, in terms of it, that population growth and, and, and where we need to hit. Um, the welcoming capacity, I think, is what the Richard Sayon had mentioned, the welcoming capacity of our communities is extremely important. That, that speaks directly to retention. And I guess I'll end on, a, a, again, a, on the OECD. Um, many years ago, the OECD had released uh, some research where they talked about, in a nutshell, the smaller a community is, uh, the more important employers are in that regard, uh, in terms of their leadership in that community. And I guess that that would be an important point that I'll end with is that that's a big part of retention in that uh, where, uh, and, you know, Moncton, uh, not a smaller community within uh, within Atlantic Canada, but we effectively are a rural region. And uh, the, the role of our employers in understanding their leadership and role in retention will have that an enormous impact in, in, in our growth going forward and getting at that diversity element that we really want to keep as a priority. So I would say that's that's really where uh, we're focusing on at ACOA in terms of uh, working with our, our partners with IRCC, settlement agencies, uh, the provinces, uh, examples of that. We talk about Atlantic Study and Stay, the AIP. Um, these, are, these are areas of activities that we're involved in, but retention it seems to be where we're turning more and more. Uh, and we, we really look forward to sort of building with our employers and working on how they can focus and, and advance their uh, role in the retention of our immigrants. So I'll stop there because I really want to hear and get at some questions from, from the audience, but uh, that, that's, uh, I think it's perhaps the best segue into turning over to Anju uh, for what the internal reality is at ACOA. Wonderful, thank you so much, Richard. We'll see you during the discussion period. And um, our next panelist, as Richard mentioned, is uh, Manju Verma. Manju has been working in the area of inclusion and anti-racism in Atlantic Canada for over 30 years. She has contributed to various textbooks as well as published both national and internationally on the topics of immigration, inclusion, and anti-racism education. Uh, her list of previous professions include university professor, conflict mediator, HR specialist, uh, all in the areas of diversity and inclusion. And she currently lead, is the lead for the newly created Office of Inclusion, Equity, and Anti-Racism at ACOA. Good morning, Manju, and thank you for being with us today. The screen is yours. Morning, everyone. Bonjour à tous. Uh, premièrement, merci pour l'invitation. So thank you, Nicole, and your team for the invitation to speak. Um, I guess a dual invitation for ACOA, which is uh, which is great. We always like that, right, Richard? Um, so as Richard pointed out, um, he he really explained the external looking um, actions that uh, that ACOA is doing to promote diversity and inclusion in Atlantic Canada, and my role is more more of the internal. Uh, what are we doing with our employees? What are we doing with our stakeholders and with our partnerships to promote diversity and inclusion? And on one hand, that may seem separate from the rest of the conversation that's happening right now at, on this panel. But really, I see, uh, you know, after hearing David and Richard speak, um, I really see the work that I do as sort of a microcosm of the, of the discussions and the barriers and the challenges that they were talking about. Um, you know, we um, at ACOA, um, our, our president, um, as Richard Cormier pointed out, is very focused on inclusion, and that's an internal uh, purpose as well. We um, are really looking at intentional hiring. So, you know, we, we look at diversity from a, uh, from a KPI point of view or from a demographic, how can we measure this quantitatively? And we do that by measuring our gaps, looking at, you know, our diversity in our, in our workforce. But then we also take it a step further with inclusion. And I think that's the connection between sort of the work that I do and the discussion that we're having about cities in general, because really at the, you know, at the end of the day, you can invite as many immigrants as, as you want. Um, and I, you know, Richard talked about wearing two hats. Uh, I'll, I'm going to up him one and wear three hats. So, you know, talking about including, uh, having an inclusive workplace, where regardless of your workplace, I'm also going to speak um, as an immigrant. Um, I've 
I, I came to Canada as two years old, so, um, but I am, you know, officially an immigrant, but I've spent, uh, spent about 50 years living in, in uh, Moncton. So I've seen the change um, diversity wise, but I've also seen what's worked and what hasn't worked from an inclusive point of view for the city of Moncton. And then the third hat is, uh, as Mayor Arnold pointed out, you know, the work that I do with organizations to have them look at themselves and saying, okay, what is it that we do from an inclusion point of view? So some of the connections that I see between a workplace and, and a city um, and really are some best practices that ACOA is doing is really not making this a corner of your desk work. And I think partly um, that's been sort of a failure for um, increasing diversity, increasing multiculturalism, is we've just added it to someone's portfolio. Um, and at ACOA, we haven't done that. We have an office that focuses mainly, well, that's the work that I do is, is to, um, you know, expand on the diversity, but also improve on the inclusion and to look at ways that we can have an equitable workplace. Um, I work with Richard uh, a lot also because there's also, you know, we also have connections between the work that we do internally and the work that we're doing externally. So we're not working in silos either. And I think that's a second barrier of cities that have tried to increase their diversity and improve their inclusion is that we've been working in silos. So it is awesome to see you know, the mayor of Dieppe, the mayor of Riverview and the mayor of Moncton sitting here and, and sharing these, these discussions. The other thing that we've done at ACOA is, you know, we've we've taken off our, our privilege binders and uh, we call racism, racism. We call hate, hate. And, um, and I, you know, in the past, we haven't been comfortable with those words. So when we talk about diversity, you know, we have everyone sitting around the table, but when we start talking about racism and we start talking about hate, all of a sudden people are hiding under those tables or they walk away from those tables because it's not a comfortable topic. And I think the spring of 2020 really put that on the table that we need to talk about this. So it's not just about bringing people here, it's about making them feel safe when they live here. Um, and it's the same thing at ACOA. It's not about just increasing you know, the diff our diverse workplace. It's about making sure that our employees have um, accessible and safe workplaces that really suit their needs. Um, and we're also looking at, um, you know, I think it was David that talked about the changing nature of work. One of, um, is one of the objectives of ACOA is to improve and hire within the Atlantic region. So that's a challenge for us because the rest, a lot of other organizations and federal departments, you know, will hire from anywhere. Um, and we're really focused on improving the uh, economy. So to increase immigration, to increase diversity, those are key factors for us. But what we're saying and, I, and what, what I would like to see in some cities um, is the work in, and Moncton actually is doing quite well in this in increasing the work of inclusion and equity and discussions around racism, around oppression, around uh, you know all of those topics that we tend to shy around, uh, away from. I'd like to see further discussions on that and increase and in including the people that are impacted by those discussions. So I'm going to stop there because I know um, you know the point of this is to have a panel with people to be able to ask questions. Thank you so much, Manju. Um, we'll be moving to our third panelist for the day here to bring us an employer point of view, I guess another employer other than OCOA uh, point of view. Um, we have Jolie, uh, Jody Matatal. Jolie has joined Greystone Energy Systems Inc. team in October 2019 in the position of Human Resources Manager. She has a background in a variety of industries, including production, healthcare, retail, and customer service contact centers in the Moncton area. She has more than 10 years of experience in providing full cycle HR support, uh, including talent acquisition, coaching, and employee engagement. Her primary focus is to lead and supervise the HR functions within Greystone Energy Systems by promoting, uh, promoting effective HR practices and working closely with the management team to implement and strengthen the organization. Good morning, Jody, and thank you for being with us today and sharing your experience. The screen is yours. Oh, you're, you're on mute, Jody. 
Here we go. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you for the introduction and for inviting us to be here today as part of this important discussion. Greystone Energy is very happy to share our experiences in recruiting newcomers and the advantages that that brings to our organization or would be able to bring to any organization. So a little bit about what our recruitment reality is at Greystone. Uh, first of all, for anyone here today that may not be familiar with Greystone Energy Systems, um, I would like to share that Greystone is a local company. We employ about 100 people in our Moncton manufacturing facility, and here we produce electronic sensors and we build every product by hand. So the primary job position that I recruit for is that of an electronic assembler. I recruit approximately 10 to 20 employees annually for this role alone. Since January of 2020, I have recruited uh, 19 new employees. 10 of those employees or new recruits are newcomers. Uh, the year before was very similar. I also recruited newcomers at a rate of approximately 50%. Our workforce uh, is about 30% of newcomers and they represent 14 different nationalities. We've been very lucky and have a great deal of success in attracting newcomers to Greystone. Some of the advantages is what I'd like to chat about uh, in having newcomers uh, join Greystone is that for us, recruiting newcomers gives us um, a variety of educational background, a variety of, of skills, of training, international employees possess and bring a fresh perspective, and they introduce new concepts that we might not otherwise have insight on. Uh, additionally, a newcomer has a very strong desire to, to learn and to understand. They are going to ask many questions and they're going to challenge the status quo. This is good for us. This is an opportunity as an employer to, to reflect on and ask ourselves, why are we doing it this way? And if we're open to that, there may be a better way. So we have lots to learn from a newcomer. Uh, additionally, uh, newcomers are very eager to put down roots in their new home. Uh, they are here to stay. This is not a transient worker. Newcomers are looking to establish themselves in, in their new home, um, in their new community, with their new employer. A newcomer's goal is to obtain their permanent residency, and they are looking for longevity in their work experience to achieve that goal. Of course, that's a great advantage for any employer. Uh, additionally, a newcomer uh, views their job as their uh, opportunity to learn about working in Canada. So this quality may be very refreshing to some employers, employers the first time you see this attribute because when we hire a newcomer, they will work harder to demonstrate that they can do the job. They will work harder to demonstrate that they are fit for the role and they will show up every day to do it. Uh, I'd also like to add the advantage of the, having a newcomer is that they are here to um, build their lives, their new lives, their new careers uh, for themselves, for their families. And they are at the same time building up our local economy uh, and therefore our province. It's a winning proposition for everyone. So as employers, I'd just like to state that we really have the power to stimulate immigration. And also, I want to mention AIPP. This is an, in, an, an initiative that increases the amount of newcomers that come to New Brunswick. It streamlines the process for employers and also for the employee. And I think that as more newcomers are successful in achieving their PR, that in turn will increase the amount of new comers coming in the future. 
that's my perspective. Great. Thank you so much, Jody. Um, before going into the discussion period, I would like to welcome the newcomer on the panel, Monica Leal. Uh, Monica is from Brazil and she's been here since 2019. Her and her husband chose to come to Moncton and shortly after arriving, she found a position at Grayson Energy. Um, she is an electrical assembler in the production area and a year and a half later, she became an integral part of the calibration and testing department within the production. Um, she basically was able to come find a job, thrive, get her doctorate. Um, your, your, your journey is, is fascinating, Monica. And thank you for being here to share that journey and your experience as an employee uh, working in a, in a Canadian New Brunswick you know, company. The screen is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's good to participate in showing uh, the view of a newcomer. Uh, I'm, I arrived in New Brunswick recently and I was lucky, I guess, to be hired at Grayson. I, I, as you mentioned, I am electrical, I have a bachelor, bachelor degree in electrical engineer. I achieved my master in my uh, PhD um, on, uh, on my university in Brazil. But uh, when we come to, to Canada, we, knows, we, know, we know that we have to start from the scratch. So I started here in Greystone uh, as uh, assembly, electronic assembly position. I uh, was trained in some uh, departments inside the uh, in Greystone. And as uh, Jody mentioned, we when we come, we want to prove to Canada, to prove for our employ, employers that we can do the job and that we, we, we are here to stay if you allowed us to do it. So uh, I grow in the company and I, I was part of the testing calibration team and uh, we applied for the, through the APP uh, the provisional uh, part of the process, it's already done. We, I am in the federal part of the process. And uh, we have, as a newcomer, we have to face a lot of challenges when we arrive. And uh, one of them, it's the language. We, when we come to a different country with completely different language, we have to face it. And uh, I got, at least Grayson was really uh, receptive to this, uh, this challenge. So I, when I came to do the interview, it was really hard to me to do it, but they, they approached me and they told that they were supportive and they, then together we could grow. And with all the, the environment of pe the people that were working there here, uh, we, I could improve a little bit but more my, my English and understand better the, the, cultural, the cultural differences and uh, have, as Jory mentioned, mentioned, the Grayson has a lot of different uh, nationalities. So we can deal with not only can Canadians, but also with other nationalities that uh, understand and deal with the same uh, issues that we do, that I did, and <clears throat> we can grow uh, faster. Now, uh, my husband, he's doing a college. We came uh, through the process that he is studying so I can work, and we applied for the APP, and because of the the manufacturing, he's currently working part-time at Grayson. Uh, Grayson already signed him a, a internship contract and a full contract time, full-time contract after that. So things as, are getting better for us and we intend to, to keep growing. And uh, we came to New Brunswick to stay in New Brunswick. We like Moncton and we don't intend to, to leave this area. So it's just a few insights that uh, my perspective as newcomer to this panel. And thank you very much for inviting me. 
Thank you very much, Monica, for, for sharing your story. I would like to have every all the panelists and uh, David and Richard back for the discussion uh, period. And I recognize we don't have a lot of time. So if we do go over time, please uh, be patient. Uh, we're going to try to do the best we can. And the session will be uh, recorded and available on the website if you do need to leave. Um, so the first question is um, actually for, um, well, for, I would say, Richard um, as well, or Richard uh, Cormier. We have two Richards on the, on the panel. Richard Cormier, uh, Manju, and Jody. Um, what advice would you give an employer who's trying to go through that, that change in internal culture, right, um, when employing uh, newcomers. It's not easy. That shift is not easy. And like you said, it's it's not, you know, just uh, another portfolio that you're giving the employer. Um, so what are your reflection on, on that change and what advice would you give employers who are trying to go through this maybe for the first time? I'll start with uh, Richard. Um, you know, look, giving, giving um, Looking back at some of the experiences and things we've learned in working with employers uh, um, at ACOA, I guess uh, not all not all employers are 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 at the, the same level in terms of their uh, hiring and 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 HR, right? I, even if we look at uh, um, employers we've spoken to, glad to hear Jody, you 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 have good things to say about the AIP. Uh, we've spoken to a lot of employers who have gone through the IPP and and have uh, have shared their experiences with that, us. And I guess what we've heard, some tend, uh, some employers tend to uh, uh, look at hiring like maybe uh, maybe checking a box, right? It's like I need I need skill, I need someone immediately. Where where do I sign to bring that person in and get them running? And 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 so as long as I get that done. Um, but when when it comes to uh, hiring newcomers, uh, like anyone really, you you're you're welcoming them welcoming them into your uh, um, um, establishment, your organization. But also, it's a community uh, play as well. So it goes back to my comment about sort of here we are, small a smaller, more rural region, um, and so that employer has that leadership role to play in terms of welcoming and, and retaining that employee. And that's really what the, the, the employer wants. They want to keep that skill. So if they're bringing someone in, uh, it's not just a worker, it's a person and it's their dependents. And, and we, we heard a little bit about that as well. So the, the effort that goes into hiring uh, someone isn't just a process, uh, a paperwork process. It really is about recognizing their role. And that's what the AIP tries to uh, uh, reinforce. It's their, their role in, in settlement, their, their role in thinking about that employee and are they, are they well supported once they arrive and, and as they you know, prepare to arrive, right? So that, that, that is a, a real important message I think that we need to get across to our employers that, uh, that you know, newcomers are, are our future and uh, uh, for growth. And, and if they want to grow, they need to recognize that their, that effort needs to, to really be put into recognizing, uh, bringing that worker in and then ensuring that they, that they're welcomed and they're part of that community. And that really is what the employer wants. They want to retain them and we all want them to stay. And, and so what is their role in that regard? So they need to, to recognize that. And I guess last point I'll mention is, uh, uh, you know, HR is, a, is an important function of any organization. Uh, you, you are making a, a long-term financial investment uh, in hiring people. And so, uh, and then it's that much more important with uh, with a newcomer. Thank you, Richard Manju. Uh, to add on to what uh, Richard said, so dedicate resources. Right? Um, you can't again can't expect people to do this at the corner of their desk. Just by expecting them, you're you're diminishing the value of it. You need to have senior support. Um, for example, at ACOA, we, um, we are trying to improve our positive space initiatives. Um, so we've just uh, created a new space for um, an LGBTQ2 plus champion. So you need to have senior support and, and champions for this because that champion is gonna take that message everywhere and be able to 
uh, access networks and circles that perhaps HR or people working on this uh, portfolio are not going to be able to access. Um, you need to accept where your employees are. Um, you know, we use a model, um, I was going to share it, but I, I won't now uh, just because of time, but we use a model at ACOA where it's a very simple model, but it's really about, we're able to plot where employees are, uh, where sectors are, and then be able to work with them to help them go up that model so that they're at what we call the commitment level, where they're actually making change in their sphere of influence. So you can't expect that the, you know, on day one, all of your employees are, are gonna be welcoming, happy, shiny people with this because there are all sorts of challenges as well. For example, one challenge is, well, if you're gonna do intentional hiring um, and diversify your workplace, you're gonna have people who are gonna be saying, you know, I've been with this organization for 20 years. What does this mean for me now? So don't, not shying away from conflict, but being prepared to have those very difficult conversations. You need to infuse it in everything. So it's not just about talking about diversity and inclusion when you're talking about intentional hiring or when you're talking about that portfolio, but in every single thing you do. So for example, communications, um, you know, do you communicate um, your memos in languages other than your official languages? Do you ensure that your, the text that you're using, the font that you're using is accessible for people who have reading um, visual issues or maybe you know, reading issues like dyslexia? So it needs to be part of everything. Um, and I think the biggest, for us, the biggest change has been, you know, traditionally we've thought diversity first, inclusion after. So let's diversify our workplace and then let's become inclusive. But what if we switched it around? What if we said, let's make our workplace inclusive first, really promote inclusivity, promote different perspectives, promote innovation. And then when we bring in employees to diversify our place, they're not walking into um, a new workplace. They're walking into an, an already inclusive workplace. So I think we need to change that model and really you know, reverse it. That's Great. it. Thank you so much, manager. Those are really, really good points. Uh, Jody, what are your thoughts on this? You're on mute, Jody. Sorry. So certainly I think enough has been said. I, I, I don't have to go through what my recruitment strategy is. However, I would say to employers that are out there that uh, have not yet started the journey to include newcomers at as part of their recruitment strategy, I would let them know that there is very little extra effort in building the network and the relationships in the community in order to uh, be able to source um, an inclusive uh, workforce uh, or candidate. Uh, I've worked at, uh, in, in, in um, I would say also that there's very little effort in becoming a designated employer. And I do think that is a critical point here because a newcomer, their objective is to obtain their PR. So it's important for an employer to understand that you're taking on the commitment to support that employee through that whole endeavor. There is very little effort in getting a designation and you should understand it as an employer that you are not an advantage for a newcomer to go to your organization if the work is not going to uh, result in um, being able to apply um, to the province. So uh, that's an important fact. And I would also say that the process of working through AIPP with a, 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 a newcomer is, is not difficult at all. And it might seem like a barrier if you haven't done it, but after you've done it, it's a great deal of effort. And I have heard feedback from other employees where employers, where they think it might be a big deal. And it's, it's not anything that um, anybody uh, couldn't certainly learn to do in a very short amount of time. Great. Thank you so much, Jody. Um, Thank you. Monica, a question for you. As um, an employee coming in, could you expand a little bit on um, the, the supports that really help to, you know, get um, acclimatized with your new job at Greystone. You mentioned the help with the language challenge. Um, what else helped you? Or if you maybe want to talk about that a bit more. 
uh, we have to face a lot of challenges and, and it's good when the community support understand, maybe not understand on our point of view, but understand that we are dealing with uh, some issues and we, we try hard to, to get through it, but it's not like, like the language is not a switch that we can just turn on and start speaking English. It, it's a process. And when the community supports is it, it's getting easier. Our, we had a, a neighborhood that well, it could spend hours talking with us so we could learn new vocabularies and do more things like uh, during, uh, with the, uh, on the workplace, when we start our process, the AIPP process, uh, we, we had so many questions we need to get into deeply on this to make sure that we were doing the right thing. And we were able to get the support from Jody that at the beginning uh, she, she was learning about the process was as we, she mentioned. So we kind of learn together and we grow all the information that we needed and apply in the process and everything works fine. So it's just, I think it's the idea that we have somebody else together with us to achieve our goals and we are not alone. So the community, the workplace, uh, everybody that can support in all the steps, it's a really good help for us as newcomers. Thank you so much, Monica. Uh, a question for David and Richard. Uh, in terms of retention, how is Moncton or the greater Moncton area doing? I know that it's, it could be, it is an issue in general for the province, but locally, uh, what's the retention rate like for the greater Moncton area? While David is looking up the number, I, I should perhaps make large, uh, general comments. The first one being that uh, as a small province, If we have Petite lower... province, si nous avons des taux de rétention plus bas que les provinces plus larges comme l'Ontario et le Québec, on ne devrait pas trop nous préoccuper de cela. Quelqu'un déménage de d'Ottawa à Mississauga, de counted as out migrants, but if someone just, you know, moves from Moncton to Amherst, then it's an out migrant. So that's a first concern. The next one is that if everyone, if expectations has been communicated properly if not expectations, but what the conditions on the ground are, regardless of where we are in New Brunswick, that people understand what, what they're getting into and everything has been done, carried out in frank, honest, and, and the best, you know, the most direct, transparent way possible. After that, people are free to migrate across the country like everybody else does. It's a constitutional right. So we shouldn't fret too much about retention rates unless obviously there would be a major issue and that people would point systematically towards something such as a housing shortage or whatever it would be, then obviously we need to take that into consideration. But the whole issue of retention rates, uh, this is the first thing we were served five years ago by the Minister of Immigration. He was telling us, you know, well, you need to improve your retention rates before we can actually, you know, really allow more immigrants in the region. Five years later, immigration is booming and retention rates, it's not something that we're discussing all that much. So, you know, we've proven that immigration works and going forward, rather than talking in generic terms about retention rates, we should talk about what are the issues that are preventing people from coming here or making them leave. Thank you, Richard. David? Yeah, so I would just concur with Richard. I don't think we should be too obsessed with retention, although we should do everything in our power to make sure that newcomers stay but they will leave for a variety of reasons, just like people that are born here leave. So we have to be a little careful about not focusing too much on that. The bottom line is we don't have great data on that. What we do have is very good data on interprovincial migration. So that's not just immigrants, that's everybody moving out of this region. And even as our immigrant numbers have gone up in the last few years, our net interprovincial migration is actually positive. We actually have more people moving in here from uh, moving to this region from elsewhere in Canada than moving out So that's a very good sign. That's actually the opposite effect we see in Fredericton. So when we did our presentation there, they have a negative interprovincial migration rate. So it looks like we don't know if they're immigrants that are leaving or non-immigrants, but they are seeing more people leave uh, to other provinces than come in. But that's not the case here. So that's good news. 
There has been media reports that the Atlantic immigration pilot uh, retention numbers are very high, as high as 90 percent. So I think, as I've been saying on this tour, uh, the biggest issue with retention is making sure that the folks coming in have a good economic opportunity. In the old days, believe it or not, with the point system, people were being admitted into New Brunswick without a job. So they scored on all the other points. They got into New Brunswick. They didn't have a job. Uh, and, you know, in six months they left. So we need to be far more focused on ensuring that newcomers can get a job aligned with their skills. Uh, and then we have a much uh, higher chance of retaining them in the long term. Great, thank you so much, David. Um, unfortunately, we're we're getting to the end of the session. I obviously this could go on forever. An hour and a half is not enough, and not certainly not with our panelists today. Um, but hopefully, this uh, session can serve as a springboard for future, um, you know, collaborations, initiatives, engagement of employers in the region. Um, one thing that we would like to do specifically uh, following this session is um, try to create a community of practice amongst employers in the region, employers that are interested to learn more about the recruitment of newcomers, uh, the creation of inclusive, equitable, and diverse workplaces. So we will be sharing through the contact list a link uh, for anyone who's interested in learning more about this uh, to please include your contact and there will be a follow-up regarding this. So uh, employers, members of the community, et cetera, but employers specifically, um, they, are, they are, I would say, like the main target as, as you can see from, from the panel today. Uh, so other than that, um, I wanna thank everyone that made this session happen. I wanna thank all the mayors that made the time to join today for this conversation. And um, I, also, I will say that the presentation and the regional report will be available shortly on the New Conversations 2.0 website. Um, la session a été enregistrée et vous allez pouvoir visionner l'enregistrement uh, sur le site web également. Uh, ainsi, uh, également, vous allez avoir toutes les ressources, la présentation de Richard et David, uh, le rapport régional, etc. Et ainsi, pour plus d'informations sur nos panélistes d'aujourd'hui. Uh, alors, si vous êtes intéressé à en parler plus, en apprendre plus à propos de la création de uh, communautés, de, de, je dirais, de milieux de travail plus inclusifs, équitables et divers, uh, je vous prie d'inclure uh, vos contacts uh, dans, la, dans le document qu'on va vous envoyer après la session. Uh, et avec ça, je vous souhaite tous une uh, très bonne journée. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of the day.